In this lesson, we're going to look at some cloud impacts on architecture. The first and most important thing is to leverage services wisely. Make sure you're choosing the appropriate service and you're leveraging it the way that it should be used. The next thing you're going to want to do is modularize heavily. Rather than one multi-purpose server, you're going to break your bits down into services that you can call from the API. You also need to know and embrace your limits. Many of the services that are provided by your cloud provider have very strict limits. You need to know what they are and when you can break them. The cloud gives you a lot of ability to take advantage of high ability and disaster recovery. We're going to look at some methods. And the last thing you need to do is to stay on top of it all. The cloud is moving at a breakneck pace, and things that may make sense today may not make sense in six or nine months. Looking at services themselves, you just need to know what services exist and where to use each. That's what this course is all about. Hopefully you'll have a very good picture by the time that we're done of what services are available to you and how to use each. Again, you're going to try to buy rather than build. If a service exists, leverage it, unless it doesn't meet some specifics that you need. You also need to know the costs associated with each service. Many of the services have several different facets. Amazon tries to give their users the ability to use a service and only pay for the service in the way that they're using it. For example, S3 has both storage and bandwidth costs. If users store a whole bunch of information and they don't access it very frequently, then their storage bill will be higher and their bandwidth bill will be lower. If users store only a little bit, but they're accessing it a lot, their storage costs will be minor, while their access costs will be high. By far, the number one way that you're going to spend money in Amazon is on EC2 instances. I'd guess that most customers probably spend 70% or more just on EC2. So minimizing your use of always-on EC2 instances is going to be key. Modularizing heavily is something else that we need to think about. Designing each piece of your system as a black box and using a provided service is going to give you a lot of flexibility, agility, and scalability. Pre-cloud, you may have had a single server where you installed several pieces of software. In this example, I'm saying maybe it's a small company. They invested a whole bunch in that single server, so they throw everything on it. Maybe RabbitMQ for a queuing system, probably an email server, may have even put the web server and or database all on that single machine. In the cloud, you want to leverage individual services, such as SQS, the queuing service, SES, the email service, ELB, the load balancing service, and RDS, the database service. It's incredibly important in the cloud to know and embrace your limits. Become very familiar with every service that you expect to use. Know your upper limits on those, and also be aware of what the other services are available to you. For example, RDS has a maximum database size of three terabytes. In this course, we talk about every service and what its upper limits are. S3 has a maximum object size of five terabytes. This wasn't always the case. For example, RDS just changed in Q1 of 2013. Before that, it had a maximum size of one terabyte per database. Although S3 is a great place to store data, Glacier came out in about Q4 of 2012, and that's a better way now to store archive data. The cloud gives you a lot of flexibility with regards to high availability and disaster recovery. Study and deploy the best practices here. For example, use S3 for static content, stuff like images, CSS, JavaScript, and HTML, and also leverage multi-AZ deployments to allow your sites to remain up even if one AZ goes down. Let's take a second to look at aws.amazon.com slash architecture for some best practices here. If we browse to the AWS Architecture Center at slash architecture from aws.amazon.com, you can see that there's a lot of great information here. Amazon provides some reference architectures for things like a web hosting application, batch processing, and so forth to show you the quote unquote right way to do things in the cloud. There's tons of these. If you scroll down to the very bottom, you can also find several architecture white papers from AWS to give you the quote unquote best way to do things in AWS. Although we can't cover all of the architecture use cases inside of this page, I highly suggest you go through and read things that are important to you. There are specific ways to do things right and wrong in the cloud, and this covers many of the right ways to do it. And most importantly, once you think you're all done, you never are. The cloud changes at a breakneck pace, AWS in particular. Refer to the Staying on Top of AWS Services lessons for some tips on how to stay on top of things and make sure you're always using the best service in the best way possible. This has been Cloud Impacts on Architecture.